Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We have been studying together in the Epistle to the Galatians, verse by verse, on weekends in our uh, Sabbath uh, videos. And usually I talk about something else on Wednesday. I'm going to kind of change things up a little bit. We're going to continue doing that on Sunday. But I want to just kind of share with everyone here this Wednesday what we're talking about on Sunday. But I also want to bring into it uh, the definition of redemption. Uh, redemption is probably the most precious word in the whole, uh, the entire Christian vocabulary. The justified man shall live by God's faithfulness. We've been seeing that in our verse by verse studies, we've, in Galatians chapter 3, the Holy Spirit sends Paul and Titus to Paul and Barnabas as well to Jerusalem to discuss with the church leaders this concept of grace versus works or works versus grace. And the Holy Spirit points out very clearly how foolish the Galatians must be to have, to have assumed that they could begin something that, or finish something that they didn't begin. That they could begin in the Spirit and, and be made perfect in the flesh. In fact, what the flesh could not do in beginning the process, they would conclude that it could do in finishing the process and just how foolish that, that idea really was. And then the Holy Spirit brings into the picture Abraham. That Abraham believed God and it was imputed to him for righteousness. And of course the popular opinion today is if you don't think it through that Abraham was made righteous because he believed God and that's where modern Christianity is. That was the basic teaching of Pelagius and Arminius. It's important to look at church history. It was uh, severely and soundly rejected by all the church councils, but over the past 400 years it's become apparent that Pelagius won and predominantly that which is called Christian today is not Christian. It's Romanist. The Protestant position is that we are made righteous by the finished work of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the, the Protestant position. And as righteous people that He made righteous, as a result of that, we believe Him that Abraham believed because God called him. Isaiah 51, God called him alone, didn't call his wife, didn't call his dad, didn't call his brethren. God says, I called him alone. Look to the pit from which you've been digged. God pulled Abraham out of that pit. And we know from the Scriptures that whom... He foreknew, He also did predestinate. And those whom He predestinated, He called. And all of those whom He called, He made righteous. And that's Romans chapter 8. Because God had made Abraham righteous. Abraham believed God and was shown to be righteous. That's the order. God acts first, man acts second. If we speak of the Scriptures, we normally speak of Genesis to Revelation. There was, of course, there was no Genesis. There was no Revelation or anything in between that in Abraham's day. I have no idea what was written down at that time. Surely Moses hadn't written the book of Moses 
in Abraham's day. Moses wasn't even born. And yet, there, in these passages, the Holy Spirit says, the Scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached the Gospel to Abraham. What Scriptures preached the Gospel to Abraham? Well, God preached the Gospel to Abraham. The Holy Spirit is clearly telling us there in verse 7 of chapter 3 in Galatians that we cannot separate God from His Word. And we have that confirmed in John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was, was with God, and the Word was God. And He says, In, in thee all nations sh shall be blessed. Verse 9, So then they which are from faith, or be from faith, out of faith, are blessed with faithful Abraham. Again, again we have the concept of, of faith or faithfulness. I've been told by many, many people that what is taught in this church has never been taught anyplace else, and that's simply not true. This channel, this there isn't anything like new truth. The truth is the Word of God. The problem is the system has become so Romanized that people are no longer exposed to the truth of, the, of this book. Most Christians, most of your friends, Christian friends, believe what they hear from the pulpit or what they hear someplace else or what they've read in a book or how that they were raised, what their parents believed. But very few seem to believe what they believe because they studied it and they know the Word of God. And folks, I'm going to say that's pathetic. Let's, let's look at our word saved for just a moment. In systematic theology, salvation is a word that it, salvation denotes the whole process by which God delivers us from all that would, would prevent our attaining to the highest good that God's prepared for us. All I have ever taught here on this channel is, is that one is made righteous by the death of Jesus Christ. That's what the book says. The fact that He died in your place. And because you are made righteous, you believe and you exercise faith. That makes the prospect of faith very difficult because it is virtually impossible to draw a line between your faith and the faithfulness of God you do not place your trust in an unfaithful God. You don't do that. You place your trust in a faithful God. The big difference is, is that your trust or your faith may waver. It may vary. It, it may almost fail. The Lord said to Peter, I pray that thy faith fail thee not. God's faithfulness wasn't ever in question. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His, His faithfulness is not going to fail. So we Christians are they which are from God's faithfulness, and that's not ours, but God's. And you can, you can say, well, Steve, that's, it's, it's, it's your trust in the faithfulness of God. That's fine but it's the faithfulness of God. That is the basis of your faith that God is faithful. Not you. So in our weekend studies through Galatians, we're learning that they which are from God's faithfulness are being blessed. That's a present tense. Being blessed with faithful Abraham. It's put in the present tense. The same blessings that were showered on Abraham, dearly beloved, are showered on you. 
And that was before there was ever anything like circumcision. Now that, that should be intuitively obvious to any Judaizer in Galatia that what we're talking about in Abraham's experience preceded any work of the law. Habakkuk 2.4 The justified man shall live by faith. Now, that is quoted three times in the New Testament and never quoted like it is in the Septuagint. I think you all know what the Septuagint is. <clears throat> You'll see it abbreviated as LXX or the number 70. The historical tradition says that 70 Jewish scholars were placed in 70 different rooms in total isolation and told to translate the Old Testament into Greek. And they did that. And when they compared all 70 translations, they were identical. And so the descendants of Alexander the Great concluded that the translation must be perfect since they were all the same. Now, to tell you the truth, folks, nobody knows whether that's true. What you, what you can do if you are a student in these things or read comments on the, on the Septuagint, you know, what a marvelous thing it is. Think of it. The Septuagint, folks, is older by a thousand years than the oldest Hebrew manuscript we ever had until the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so you would read in critical texts how important a Septuagint was because it gave us a view as to how the Hebrews 300 years before Christ looked at their Scriptures. And the oldest manuscript we had of the Old Testament, actual manuscript of the Old Testament, prior to 1947, was 1100 A.D. But we had copies of the Septuagint back to the first century. So in one respect, the Septuagint gave us a thousand year jump on the Hebrew or the Jewish Old Testament. It is absolutely invaluable because we get a marvelous insight into how experts, I'm, I'm talking about linguistic experts, considered the meaning of Jewish words to be. So once we look at a Hebrew word and then see how that these scholars translated that Hebrew word into Greek, we get further insight into the meaning of that Hebrew word. And you read on and on and on how wonderful the Septuagint is. And now you come to Habakkuk verse 4, chapter 2. The man who is justified shall live by my faithfulness. That's what the Septuagint says. And so now, your experts say, well, of course they say, well, there are many errors in the Septuagint, and the Apostle Paul clearly corrects these errors, like, like in Galatians, you know, chapter 3, verse 11. The justified man shall live by faith. That is, his faith. The man's faith. And the argument goes that Paul surely had the Septuagint, and Paul fully must have realized the Septuagint was in error. And so basically what he did was he corrected it in Galatians chapter 3. That is not what happened. What a marvelous thing it is to realize that the Jews 300 years before Christ looked at the Hebrew and thought it said this. They thought it said 
the righteous man lives by my faithfulness. I figure about half the Christians capitalize the word his in, in Habakkuk 2.4. In your English Bible, it says the justified man shall live by his faith. And the word his isn't there in Galatians 3 verse 11. But linguistic experts said that it ought to be a capital H so that they translated it specifically in the Greek, the righteous man shall live by my faithfulness, says God Almighty. Dearly beloved, we are not under law, but grace. What God said to Abraham and what God says to the human heart about the law is that we have to continue without interruption, without mistake, without slip, and it has to be constant, continuing all the th to do all the things which are written in the book of the law. Galatians 3, verse 11, but that no man is being shown to be, that's a present tense, to be shown to be righteous, present passive, that no man is being exhibited as righteous by the law. The law doesn't show you to be righteous because you have never broken any law yet doesn't mean that you're righteous. And it doesn't mean that you never will break a law. But listen, if you're righteous, you will never break a law. That's why in Timothy it tells you that the law was not written for a righteous man, but for sinners. For sinners. And God does not call you, His child, a sinner. What He calls you is righteous. You know, it was one glorious day, the day I came to realize God doesn't call me a sinner. He calls me righteous. You know, and I can, I can, throw, a, uh, I can throw a terrible two-year-old tantrum and I can protest loudly, God, I'm not righteous, but God calls me righteous because He made me righteous. He clearly declares that He won't call that good which isn't good, and He won't call that evil which is not evil. So if He calls me righteous, I'm righteous. Yet today, modern, unfortunately, sadly, tragically, today, modern theological teaching is that God assumes you to be righteous even though you're not. You're not really the ultimate end of that nonsense is that, that he can take an unrighteous creature to heaven, which, which he, he can't. So we got a problem there. You see the same thing in 1 John chapter 3. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed abides in him, and he has no power. He has no ability at all to sin. And folks, you know, say, well, you know, well, pastor, it doesn't really mean that. I read a commentary on Romans 5.19, for as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, even so by the obedience of the one, that's Christ, shall the many be made righteous. And the writer said, now, don't get the idea that that verse is saying that you were made righteous. And I thought, wow, that's the, that's the idea I got. And that's absolutely the concept that the Holy Spirit is presenting. Dearly beloved, I was not made a sinner. I was not made unrighteous in Adam because I chose to, because I elected to, because I made a decision because 
I came down an aisle, I walked down an aisle, and I accepted Adam's hand. Okay? I was made a sinner in Adam absolutely separate from any decision I made, any choice of mine, and I was made righteous in Christ absolutely, I want to scream this out, absolutely separate from any choice I made, any choice of mine. No man is justified by law in the sight of God. It is evident. For the just shall live by God's faithfulness. Modern Christianity, and I put that, that the word Christianity in quotes, declares that if you continue in faithfulness, you'll be redeemed. But if you don't continue in faithfulness, well, you might not. And folks, that is not true. That isn't true. The burden of continuing in the law, I mean, every step, every thought, every motive, every action under the scrutiny of the law. I mean, folks, there remains a rest for the people of God because He suffered and He died in our place. Our life with Him isn't based on continuance. It's based on the faithfulness of our God. The faithfulness of God in providing our redemption and that we are made righteous. Made righteous. The International Bible Encyclopedia says this is not because of you or your faith but because of an act that preceded any, any act of Christian faith, the death of Christ. That's the Protestant doctrine. That's why it's in the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. But it isn't, folks, it isn't the doctrine that's prominently taught today. What have we done? What have we done? Doesn't biblical truth mean anything anymore? Think of the price that God paid and the privilege that you have to hold in your hand His Word, the Word of God. What a privilege. You know, I watch this antique show. It's, it's a, well, it's a junk show. You know, they use the wrong name. Stuff I'd throw away. You know, I had a, a, whole, a trailer full of it. You know, anybody can have it that wants it, you know. $25,000 for an old desk that I'd burn as kindling. Uh, you got to be kidding. Here's this book, actually handwritten by Charles Dickens. Brought a ton of money. And folks, you have the privilege of holding in your hand the Word of the Almighty Sovereign God. And it doesn't cost you a dime. I can't imagine anything that compares to that. To God's Word. I wouldn't trade it for anything. There is no continuing. The justified man lives by God's faithfulness. Out of faithfulness. Not, 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 the, not his own, but God's. I have a high regard for the Septuagint. I do believe that it is a marvelous insight into how the Greek mind looked at the Hebrew words. The man who is justified from my faith shall live. What a powerful thought in the Old Testament Scriptures. The law is not out of faith. The law is not from faith. But the man that doeth them shall live in them. What a, what a terrible place to live, to walk, where every step is, is suspect, where every thought is suspect, where every action is, is suspect. The law didn't come from faithfulness. The law came from the holiness and the righteousness of God. The faithfulness of God was what fulfilled the law. 
The law has been fulfilled. There is no law for you. You are not under law, but under grace. I don't, I don't know why that concept seems so difficult for Christians to grasp. If you're not a thief, you'll never steal. If you're not a murderer, you'll never murder. You do not need to steal in order to be a thief, and you do not need to, to murder in order to be a murderer. And in the same way, if you are righteous, there is no law. And it's that concept that it is so difficult for Christians to wrap their mind around. Oh, I, I know I'm not righteous, Pastor Steve, because I sinned. That, that, that's the answer I always get. You can't say I'm righteous because you don't know how I live. I get so tired of hearing that. I know the natural man cannot please God. Why should we argue with God's Word? They that are in the flesh cannot please God. They're not subject to the law of God and indeed cannot be. The flesh cannot be subject to the law of God. Years ago, a pastor took me to lunch and he said, you know, he said, Steve, I believe this book every bit as much as you do, but, but there are some exceptions to the way that you take the Word of God. You know, and, and I said, well, well, what are those? The natural, the man that is in the flesh cannot please God, he says, and, and that's, that is only true. Well, that, that's only, that's true of, of everything else except receiving Christ, accepting Christ. That pleases God. A person has to accept Christ to, to be born again, and he has to be born again to be made righteous. So the process begins with us. And I said, you mean us? The individual who cannot please God, who is not subject to the law of God, the flesh who cannot hear the Word of God, who does not believe God, you're telling me that's where the process begins? Galatians 3 says that the process begins in the Spirit, not in the flesh. You who began in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by means of the flesh? The process, folks, began with God, not with us. It began with an act that, that preceded any act of Christian faith. And that was the death of Christ. That's always been the Protestant position. It, it is not the Protestant position today. It's not the position in, in Bible schools, in many seminaries, in most churches. But it has always been the Protestant position. It has never, ever been the Roman position. Let me tell you, they're winning. Except my God is God. The law is not from faithfulness, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. What a terrible place to live. How wonderful to live in Christ, in the grace of God, a peace that passes understanding. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having been made a curse for us. He's not... He's not been made a curse potentially for you if you'll do something about it. You know, like He's done all He can do. Now the rest is up to you. And we'll decide who wins or loses by the choices that we make. The word for there is hooper or hooper, depending on how you pronounce your Greek words. Nobody really knows how the Greeks pronounce 
pronounce them. I I don't know how you pronounce it. The Greek professor I had was it was Hooper. Uh, others it's Hooper. But whatever the word is, it means instead of. Christ was made a curse instead of us. And that's not instead of, of all. It's instead of us. If He was made a curse instead of you, and you are, are still made a curse, well then, we've got a big problem. We've got, it's, you know, we've got a double jeopardy. The double penalty for this, and we have an unrighteous God. If Christ died in your place, you cannot die. If Christ was made the curse instead of you, you are not made the curse. The, the way Christ was made a curse is it had been written with the result that it stands written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. The reason God put that in the law was because of the crucifixion of, of Jesus Christ. You know, what they did back in the Old Testament times, I mean, if, if the crime was particularly terrible and you, you, know, you stoned an individual or you hung them or, you, or executed them or whatever, uh, what you did is you, you hung the body up on a pole and you exposed it to the public to open shame and disgrace and God said in His law, cursed is everyone that is hung on a, on a pole. All right. Now I'm sure many a Jew and probably many a Hebrew kid asked, probably asked his dad, you know, why? You know, what, what difference does it make? They were held to open disgrace, public display of their crime and disgrace. Christ had to be hung on a pole he had to be hung on a cross. That's how He was cursed for us. He was not cursed because He committed any sin. He was made sin. Not because He committed sin. He was made sin by being hung on a stick of wood. And He did that in your place. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. We are not under law. We're under grace. The word here for redeemed is one of, the, of three possible words. It's, it's ek agorazo. The agora, if you go to Athens today, is I've been there. It's the marketplace. There are several reasons to buy things in the marketplace. Uh, you buy... Uh, I had an argument with a girl who feels that a cow has rights and should never be killed and eaten. You know, and I said, I, I don't know. I don't know whether to believe you or God. And, you know, well, well, and she says, well, what do you mean? Well, Romans 6 says, I've given you every beast of the field for food. The only reason for that cow is, is for me to eat him. Boy, she didn't like that. But that, folks, that's what God said. Gave me a cow to eat. Now He says, every beast of the field, well, I, I don't, I've never tried skunk. I, anyway, I won't get into that. One of the reasons to buy meat is to eat it. One of the reasons to buy nails are to use them, but there's another reason to buy. Okay? You can buy something as a prized possession. You know, you can buy, you can buy for, for example, something to resell. I bought a horse one time because I was going to resell the horse and I was going to make a ton of money. I didn't make a ton of money. But anyway, that was the reason that I was buying it. For resale. You know, or I'm buying it to use. But there's a third reason to buy, and that's to own 
to possess, to prize. That's this word, ek agarazo. It means to buy, never to be resold. Christ bought us. The word redeemed there, it'd be better, I don't know, to translate it ransomed. The redeemed. Folks, redeemer is one of our most precious words, if not the single most, per, uh, beneath Christ. But somehow, we lose the concept of paying a price. He paid a price. It's up to you to decide whether you think it was enough. God says it was enough. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. God is satisfied. And there's therefore now no judgment for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. None. Romans 5, He was delivered because of our offenses. Christ was not delivered because God thought that'd be a good idea or that it, or it had to be done or that it would be a, you know, a good example you know, of martyrdom. Folks, He was delivered because of our offenses. That's why He was delivered. And He was raised from the dead because we were made righteous. If He had not, if He hadn't made us righteous, He could not have risen from the dead. Because the clear evidence would be that He didn't pay enough. And that's our word. Redeemed. He paid a price. Was it enough? Yes. He rose from the dead. And what's the next verse? Being therefore justified by faithfulness, we have peace with God. You never have peace with God through the law. We have peace with God. What a wonderful thought. He paid a price. He paid a price so that we would never be resold. That we, that we never go back in that, in that marketplace. There's never another question about, our, about our, our relationship to God and our value to Him. Dearly beloved, we, you and I, we are a prized possession that He purchased and took out of marketability. Took out of the marketplace. He now holds us as His prize and we are a gift from God the Father to God the Son. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, how thankful we are for your precious word, may the Holy Spirit take what's been said and filter it for truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite you to join us on Sunday as we continue our studies through Galatians. Until then, we love you all. We truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.